Hello, how's it going everyone? It's Miss Thompson and this is your first video over chapter one and um, let's get going because I'm going to try to make this short and sweet for y'all. All right, so first of all, a few things that I want to talk about with you guys is why I decided to do this flip classroom thing. Okay, so I've talked to a lot of my apes teacher friends and they've shown me their data from the apes exam scores in the past, you know, the past few years and stuff like that. And those who have decided to flip their classrooms tended to have higher apes exam scores. Okay, because this class has so much content and the test can be, you know, extremely broad, but still really specific. I think this will be really helpful for you. Okay. Another good thing about doing this is it allows for self-paced learning, okay? It has more control for you, so you can take the time that you have at home or maybe during Tiger Dead, whenever you need to, to do this, right? And um, I kind of talked about it in class, but I think it's better for you guys to know that you need to go home, you need to watch a 10-minute Ed Puzzle video, take some notes, and be done with your homework, right? Instead of taking home a lab and not knowing if it's going to take you 10 minutes or an hour. So I think this will be really good for you. Um, there's going to be less frustration for you, right? Because you're doing the easy stuff at home. You just get on your computer, play the video, answer the questions on the Ed Puzzle, take some notes if you want, and everything's good to go. Okay. This allows us to explore content more deeply in class, so that'll be awesome, meaning you're also gonna have more student-student interaction, you know, less of me talking, less teacher-centered stuff, more student-centered stuff, right? You can talk with each other, um, do your labs, do your activities, discuss, 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 because when you're talking and discussing and debating and stuff like that, that's when things get stuck in your head and that's what I want to happen, okay? Another thing that this is really great for is because if you miss school, uh, you're really not going to be behind because, you know, if you just had this for your homework, you got to go home, you got to watch the video, you'll be good to go, right? Okay, so let's get into a few other things. First, what you need to do, this is what I expect of you, my expectations are of you as far as homework and stuff goes, okay? You guys need to watch the Ed Puzzles, all right? While you're watching the Ed Puzzles, you have the option to take notes because when you have your quizzes, all right, over the chapters, you are able to use your notes that you have taken, okay? That's good, but the notes have to be handwritten, okay, it has to be your handwriting. If you write any vocab, that's completely fine as well, but they do need to be handwritten, and when you're done with the quiz, you're gonna turn it in, okay? So, another thing that I'm gonna need from you guys to do is to read the chapters, okay? The book is a really easy read, Okay, um, it's not like it's anything crazy difficult, but it will help you a whole bunch if you go through, you read the chapters, and you do the reading guides for those different chapters, okay? You can also take notes from the reading and use those handwritten notes on your quiz, okay? So again, another good thing. The reading guides are optional, right? I mentioned that in class, but they are for five points of extra credit on your unit exam. So there you go. Beautiful. Let's look at this. Okay, so our first chapter is called Studying the State of Our Earth, all right? So we've been talking about a lot of these things in class the past couple of weeks, all right? So one of the main points that you need to know from chapter one, and this is just a little, little taste, okay, because we're gonna get into this later, but is the fact that humans alter natural systems, okay? So this is a table that's in your book that you should be very familiar with, okay? Um, but humans manipulate their environment more than any other species, Okay, so we convert land from its natural state into urban, suburban, agricultural areas, all sorts of stuff like that. We have changed the chemistry of our air, our soil, our water, sometimes intentionally. Okay, so we know we add fertilizers and stuff to the soil, but also unintentionally sometimes. And uh, that happens as a consequent of, consequence sorry, of activities that uh, generate pollution. So even where we don't manipulate or intend to manipulate the environment directly, the simple fact that we are so abundant, right, there's 7.7 .7 billion of us, really does affect our surroundings, okay? So these are your five key global environmental indicators that we are going to talk a lot about throughout the school year. So the first one is biological diversity, okay? And I'm not gonna go through all these, but these are things that you should be familiar with, okay? Food production, all right? The average global surface temperature and CO2 concentrations, another thing that you guys need to be familiar with. The human population going up, 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 and resource depletion. Okay, so all these things here are things you should be very familiar with. You should know the recent trend for these, 
what it looks like in the future, and the overall impact on environmental quality. Okay, so these are things that we've talked about in class before vaguely, and we'll get into much more detail on. But you might see something like this, you know, on the quiz, on the test, or whatever. Just throwing it out there. Okay, so another word that you will need to know that we will talk about all year long is this word, sustainability. Okay, it's a magic word. So if you want, go ahead and pause it, take a minute, think about what the word sustainability means to you. Okay, so let's look at it real quick. Here's the definition for you. Living on Earth in a way that allows us to use its resources without depriving future generations of those resources. Okay, so the future and our future depends on us being able to live sustainably in our sustainable development. Um, we know that people living in developed nations consume far greater share of the world's resources than do people in developing countries. How does this affect our environment? Um, it's easy to imagine a very small human population living on this planet without degrading its environment. There simply wouldn't be enough people to do significant damage. Today, however, our population is 7.7 .7 people and growing. Okay, so um, this is one of the things we're going to talk about all throughout the year. But scientists are asking, how will we be able to support these people in this growing population? These are examples of problems of our future, right? And it's your responsibility to figure that stuff out. And I am here to help you do that. So in order to live sustainably, here are a few bullet points. Environmental systems must not be damaged beyond their ability to recover. Okay. Renewable resources must not be depleted faster than they can regenerate. And non-renewable resources must be used sparingly. Okay. Let me move this because it's kind of in the way. So there's also this term. It's called sustainable development. Oh, I can make this smaller. Oh, yeah. There we go. Ah! Oh! <laughs> Oh, so I forgot. I put some funny pictures in here. The other day I was looking up the best face swaps and I was just losing it at this one. So there you go. Let me go back. Okay. So development that balances current human well-being and economic advancement, advancement with resource management for the benefit of future generations. So we want to focus on this aspect of sustainable development for everything that we do. There's another shot at that one more time. Let me try to get this smaller again. Ah, I can't get any smaller. Oh, this is how the smallest it gets. Oh, they're perfect. <laughs> oh my gosh. Isn't that funny? <laughs> okay. So let's talk about ecological footprint and your ecological footprint, what that means. Okay. There's a way that we can measure how many resources we use. And uh, that's what we call our ecological footprint. So simply put, it's a measure of how much a person consumes expressed as an area of land. All right how many land resources or how much land we need to support ourselves, basically. Okay, so here you go. This is an infographic that kind of tells you a little bit about the ecological footprint. So the uh, things that are included, I don't know how to get this to go away, in your ecological footprint are the things down here at the bottom, okay? Your carbon footprint, your built up land, forest, cropland, pasture, fisheries. In a few days, do an assignment, okay, that will show you what your ecological footprint is. Okay, so by definition, when we're talking about our ecological footprint, it is this, all right, the amount of biologically productive land and water needed to supply the people with resources and to absorb and recycle the waste and pollution produced by such resource use. One of the things that you guys need to know is that your ecological footprint is a measure of area. Okay, so the unit is hectares, H-A. That's probably something you've never learned about before. So let's talk about that a little bit more. If you're not familiar with what a hectare is, it's about 10,000 square meters. So if you want to look at the picture right here, it kind of gives you an idea, right? Um, larger than, I guess, a soccer field, a little bit, football field, whatever. I know they're not the same size, but you, you feel me? Okay, this is uh, your 400 meter track. This grass area is about 1.12 hectares. So that gives you an idea about the size of what a hectare is. Okay, so how much biologically productive space is actually available to us on this planet? Okay, you can ignore that picture. Um, but if you want to know the answer to that, it is about 11.3 billion hectares. So when we're talking about biologically productive space, we're talking about croplands. Okay, where can we grow food? Forests. 
um, fisheries, you know, places where we can access fish and things like that. You don't need to know these specific numbers, but they're just to help you kind of conceptualize it, right? If you do the math and you divide this by the 7.7 .7 billion people we have on this planet, that's about 1.5 hectares available per capita per person, okay? So think about this for a second. What's going to happen to this number with our increasing population size? Is it going to increase or is it going to decrease? Let's see the answer. Oops, should say decrease. <laughs> Circle should be over decrease. So obviously, as the amount of people go up, the amount of land that we have for those people is going down. So we got to figure out how that's going to work. All right. So if our biological capacity to replenish renewable resources and absorb waste and pollution is exceeded by the population's ecological footprint, there is an ecological deficit. So if we use more resources than what the planet can replenish, we have an ecological deficit, right? Makes sense. Okay, so here's a map for you guys to see. This is showing ecological reserves and deficits. So just by looking at the color, you can assume what it means. But uh, basically anything that's yellow and green has an ecological reserve, meaning it has, it's in good standing, okay? It has plenty of reserves, all right? Yellow means there's less than 50% or they're at less than 50% of bio capacity. Green is good, okay? There's greater than 50% of bio capacity that they're at, okay? So, you know, you can see those countries. You got Canada, a lot of South America, Russia, quite a bit of Africa, Australia. There you go. When you're talking about ecological deficits, though, greater than 50% of bio capacity are going to be the red countries, okay? So, look at us. United States is there. You know, we've got Northern Africa, most of Europe, a lot of Asia as well. Okay. Not necessarily Southeast Asia, but orange represents less than 50% of biocapacity. And so Southeast Asia would fall under, under that color there. So let's see, this is an ecological footprint per, per capita map. So I know the key is not clear over here, but essentially it's showing hectares per capita, so hectares per person. So red is down here at the bottom, right? It says 5.74 to 9.57. That's talking about hectares per person that, you know, people in those countries are using. So what do you know? We are bright red here. Yeah, Australia as well, a lot of places in Western Europe. Um, that means we have a lot of land needed per person. So it tells you a little bit about our lifestyles. If you look at the green, that's going way, way, way down. So people in the green countries use very little land per person. Okay. They're using way less resources than we are here in the United States. And we'll talk a lot more about that. Okay. So that kind of brings us to this question. You know, we're going to talk about developing versus developed countries a lot throughout the school year, but there is a correlation. Okay. There's a correlation between average income and ecological footprint, okay? Usually developing countries tend to have a smaller ecological footprint, okay? Um, as a whole, the United States is very wealthy and our ecological footprint is much higher than many other countries. So why might this be? Let's look at it. So why do developed countries have a larger footprint? Well, there's a few reasons. One of the main reasons is our diet, right? We have the luxury of getting easily accessible and affordable meat. Okay. So in, in the United States and in other developed countries, we eat a very meat rich, meat rich diet versus grains. Okay. So for energy, we have a very high fossil fuel dependence and we create a lot of CO2 emissions, right? The other thing has to do with the biome. So the amount of carbon dioxide fixation depends on climate and vegetation type. So how much carbon dioxide a country can you know take in depends on what their country is made out up of is it primarily forest is it primarily cement stuff like that okay so in a lot of developed countries we might not necessarily have a ton of land left that is green space okay it is a graph okay it's just a simple graph showing what we just talked about so one of the things we'll be discussing throughout the school year is the unequal use and distribution of many things to humans in this world, okay? So the difference in quality of life between developed and developing countries is vast, right? Affluent countries tend to use more resources, which results in more pollution, which impacts everyone, 
right? If we were able to increase the quality of life in these poor countries, the developing countries to have access to more resources and um, lives more like us in the United States, they would be using lots of resources, even more resources than that, what they're using right now. And that would increase pollution. So it's a very fine line, kind of fragile ethical line, I guess you could call it there that we're going to discuss, you know, how can we provide a good quality of life to all people on this planet without frying our planet? Okay. So let that kind of sizzle in your brain. You can see here, it's comparing high income countries to the middle and low income countries. Oh, I threw some jokes in here. So let's see what you come up with it for this one. How many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? Give it a second. See if you can think of it. Ten tickles. <laughs> Get it? Ten tickles. Tentacles. Octopus. Octopus have tentacles. <laughs> Funny.